Today on Better Book Clubs, what do we mean when we say a book is beautifully written? I've noticed that I talk a lot in my videos about novels being beautifully written, but I've never really explained what I mean by that. So today I want to use Laird Hunt's novel Zori as an example to illustrate for you what I mean when I talk about a novel being beautifully written. So when we talk about the difference between popular novels, that is novels that are really easy to read and um, you just kind of breeze through them, and literary novels, which might be a little bit more challenging, we're we're usually talking about the difference between a novel that's beautifully written and a novel that's just kind of there for the taking. So what is it that makes a novel beautifully written? Both popular novels and literary novels pay attention to things like character and plot and ideas. But one thing that distinguishes a beautifully written novel from an ordinary novel is that it pays more attention to language. One thing I mean by that is that it uses language in unexpected ways, which is what poetry does. And of course, poetry is all about language, paying attention to language and doing something a little bit different with it. So let me start by giving you an example of that from Zori. And when I talk about using language in unexpected ways, I'm not just talking about metaphor, I'm talking about using language in a way that surprises the reader um, in order to get at the sense of something. So a metaphor might be one way to do that, but this idea of using language in unexpected ways goes way beyond metaphor and figurative language. Let me give you an example. So in this passage, the main character, Zori, has gone on a little road trip to the ocean. And Hunt writes, The dunes stretched all around, as far as the mist would let her see. Little wind-harassed trees grew here and there, and the dunes were covered with long grass and did not look like the pictures she had seen in Life magazine of their great cousins in the Sahara Desert. Gull gulls called overhead. There was no one else around. The sand never stopped moving. She bent over and dragged a finger through it. In places it was damp and in others dry. She took up a pinch between her fingers and saw that not only were the grains different colors, they were also different sizes. Some of the bigger grains were rose-colored. A few appeared almost violet, and she wished she had better light and a magnifying glass. She tossed what she was holding into the air. The sand rode out and then down in a wind-feathered arc that pleased her so much she did it again. One thing that Hunt is doing here is something that you'll also find in a lot of popular novels. It's really beautiful, particular detail, and he does that really nicely. But he's also using um, some kind of unusual language, like calling the trees wind-harassed, which really helps you to picture what those trees look like. And he also talks about the sand. The sand never stopped moving. And again, you can really picture that. And it's not, normally I think if we were to describe that, a writer might say the wind was blowing across the sand. But instead, Hunt puts that on the sand itself, almost as if to personify it. So there are a number of things like that that are happening in this little passage that are, I think are good examples of using language in a very unusual way. Another thing that makes a passage beautifully written is the cadence and the rhythm of it. And that's something that a literary writer will also pay attention to. How the language sounds, how the syllables and the words and the phrases sound when they're strung together. So let me give you another example from Zori of what that might sound like. Um, so Hunt writes, she thought of Noah standing at the edge of the field years before, holding a letter in his hand and talking about whirlwinds in his head. She thought of him standing with a saw in his hand, talking about falling and falling, and she thought about Virgil lying somewhere in Frankfurt, waiting to be lowered into the ground. She thought about Harold falling through the sky and Opal sitting in an ice bath and Mrs. Thomas eating carrot stubs out of her hand. She thought of Noah standing over the fire at the 4th of July picnic, thought of his long arms in the red light, thought of oats and her red carpet, thought of Noah crying no more than two feet away from her 
thought of her arms going out like they had for Ruby, thought, I am thinking more than I need to, and I ought to go home. So I've emphasized the syllables a little bit more um, than usual to sort of help you hear that cadence, but it's very much present in that passage. And of course, Hunt is also working with parallel structure here, repeating the structure of the sentences in order to drive that cadence home. A third important thing that a writer who understands language knows is that language is a very slippery thing. It has limitations. And so just as a visual artist understands the limitations of a certain kind of paint or of a certain kind of clay, or a musician understands the limitations of the sound that they can make with their instrument, a writer understands the limitations of words. They will work at conveying a sense through the use of words rather than assuming like a more popular writer might that the words are just tools and they're going to easily convey whatever meaning um, is trying to be conveyed. Instead, uh, a writer who writes beautifully really understands that language isn't going to do the whole job. And so you have to be playful with it and you have to use it in such a way that it, it gets across a feeling of something or an idea of something when the words themselves fail. Another thing that writers do who write beautiful books has less to do with language and more to do with form. So they really pay attention to form and rather than following the conventions of a particular genre, they'll break the conventions when they need to, not just for the sake of breaking them, but for the sake of telling the story the way the story needs to be told. So for example, in the novel Zori, Hunt is breaking up the book not so much into chapters as into um, small sections that help to tell the story. Each of these sections has its own little title, but they're not conventional titles. So for example, chapter one or section one just has a little tagline, out of this shadow into the sun. And when you put all these little taglines together, they read like a poem. So that's one example of form following the content. And if you were to read this novel, you'd probably get that the way it's been sectioned off doesn't fit into conventions of chapter breaks, but it makes a lot of sense for what this story is about. Another quality of beautifully written books is that they're written by writers who trust their readers. And what I mean by that is not everything is going to be told in a straightforward way. The writer trusts that the reader is reading carefully and thinking and picking up things between the lines, and so everything doesn't have to be said outright. Things can be implied, and the writer trusts that you're gonna get them. Sometimes we talk about show, don't tell, giving subtle clues that show something rather than telling it outright. So here's another example of that from Zori. She's observing her friend Noah and his father. Hunt writes, watching them walk away together, it struck Zori that the silence that rode the air between them was a comfortable one. For just a moment, she thought how nice it would be to walk in their company, or better, to just float quietly between them, caught on a forward-tending gust of air." So I really like that description because Hunt doesn't come out and tell us how Zori feels around Noah and his father or what their relationship is. That little explanation says something not just about the father and son, but also about how Zori connects to them. Another thing I've noticed in reading some popular fiction that has to do with this issue of trusting the reader is that a lot of times information is repeated in a popular novel. At first, when I started to think more about how these novels are put together, I thought that maybe it was bad editing. But I realized eventually that the reason character information and plot points and important details are repeated several times is because the writer is assuming an inattentive reader, therefore not really trusting the reader to hold in their minds and remember and carry through for themselves what they need to know in order to understand what's happening in the novel. As a result of all of these qualities, a beautifully written literary novel can be more challenging to read. You're going to find that these beautifully written novels pay you back with more depth and 
ideas that you can talk about together and that makes them really better choices for a lot of book club discussions. I hope that paying attention to some of these elements will help you and your book club read some literary novels more deeply and richly than you've been able to before. If you like what you see here, please subscribe and I'll be back soon with another episode of Better Book Clubs.